evening, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving. A couple weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, in one of the Bible classes, the subject of gratitude came up, and I made the comment that gratitude is merely an emotion. Thanksgiving requires uh, something to be expressed to someone. Uh, didn't mean to disparage gratitude, because without gratitude, there is no Thanksgiving. So tonight, we're going to talk about gratitude. Uh, we'll hear about it in the lessons, we'll certainly express it to God in our thanks and songs, and we'll talk about it in the sermon. The order of service is in the bulletin, except for most of the hymns that we're going to sing. So we'll start with hymn number 260, Let All Things Now Living, and then we'll just continue on as printed in the bulletin. Say happy Thanksgiving to someone near you if you haven't done that. God bless your worship. Thanks for coming. stand and we'll continue in the bulletins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Praise awaits you, O God, in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. O you, O hear our prayer, to you all will come. Those living far away fear your wonders. Where morning dawns and evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench its fear furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless it with crops. You crown the year with your bounty 
and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the desert overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. You calm the roar of the seas. You calm the people's uproar. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house. We are filled with the blessings of your holy temple. You answer us, God our Savior, and you save us by doing wonderful things. You are the hope of people all over the world. You set the mountains in place by your strength, showing your mighty power. You calm the roar of the sea. You calm the people's uproar. It is because our God of grace uses his mighty power to rescue us that we humbly approach his throne, regretting our sins and begging for his free and full forgiveness. Lord of life, I confess that I do not honor you as I should, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of self-indulgence and sins of idolatry, for the greed I have practiced and the contentment I have not, I am sorry. I am sorry for my sins. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. For Jesus' sake, please forgive me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. On behalf of God himself, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father, your generous goodness comes to us new every day. By the work of your Spirit, lead us to acknowledge your goodness, give thanks for your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson tonight is, or the epistle lesson, Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, captures the attitude of gratitude in the lives of a Christian. Yes, gratitude is something we feel inside, but what does it look like as it influences, as influences our lives on the outside? Well, the Apostle Paul captures it 
in one simple sentence. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. He writes, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you. In Christ Jesus. This is God's word. Now hear a duet from Vicar and Rachel across the lands. You're the Word of God the Father From before the world began Every star and every planet Has been fashioned by your hand All creation holds together By the power of your voice let the skies declare your glory. Let the lands and seas rejoice. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry rings out, rings out across the land. Yet you left the gaze of angels Came to seek and save the lost And exchange the joy of heaven For the anguish of a cross With a prayer you fed the hungry With a word you calmed the sea Yet how silently you suffer That the guilty may go free You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your crying love rings out Across the land With a shout you rose victorious, resting victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the land. Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, let us stand for the reading of his gospel tonight. The Holy Gospel this evening is Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. These words will also be the basis for the sermon in a little while. We read, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. 
But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And, I have, and I have, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Let's sing the hymn of the day, which this evening is number 613, Come, You Thankful People, Come. <laughs> God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours in his Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. The text for the sermon tonight is the Gospel from Luke chapter 19. Let's start with a prayer. O Lord, open my mouth and my lips would speak your truth. Open our ears to that truth, that our hearts would believe it, and the gratitude we feel in them we would express every day with our thanks. Amen. Your friends in Christ, I wonder if this is true of you as it is of me. Sometimes when I go to a fancy restaurant, I'm grumpier than you'd think because I have high expectations of what the service and the food are going to be like. 
So at a fancy restaurant, if the waiter isn't there when I and me feel like I need him, immediately I start to get grumpy. And if the food isn't quite what I thought it was going to be when I order it, I start to get critical. On the other hand, I'm sometimes happier at a fast food restaurant where my expectations are considerably lower. All I want is something to eat and quickly. If the fries are hot this time, well, that's a treat. And if everything that I ordered is actually in the bag given me, that's a bonus. This phenomena of being grumpy in a good place and happy in a bad place illustrates how powerfully expectations affect our mood and our emotions. How powerfully expectations affect our mood and our emotions, and maybe none more so than that beautiful emotion we call gratitude. Gratitude, you might want to remember this next line. Gratitude is what happens when kindness exceeds expectation. Gratitude is what happens when kindnesses exceed expectation, when they're undeserved. True gratitude, if you've ever experienced it under that definition, feels sort of like laughter of the heart as these wonderful surprises are received. On the basis of tonight's Holy Gospel about Zacchaeus, I'd like to explore with you a little bit more tonight the role of gratitude in our giving thanks and how expectation, both big ones and low ones, affect it. The hope is that Better understanding this will not only make for a better Thanksgiving holiday, but more importantly, will help us be those kind of people who seem to be thankful practically all the time. Now Zacchaeus. We all think we know something about Zacchaeus. Let's just start out with the obvious. He was short. But did you know that where he lived, Jericho, was one of the most desirable places to live in all of Palestine? It was literally an oasis in the desert, shaded with large groves of palm trees and balsam trees. It was so wonderful that when Mark Anthony fell in love with Cleopatra, he gave it to her as a present. She, in turn, handed it over to Herod to collect the taxes for her. He thought it so awesome, he bought it from her, built a house there, spent most of his time there, even died in Jericho. This was a wonderful place to live, an expensive place to live. The Romans noticed not only its beauty, but its commercial importance, as many roads intersected there, many of them going back and forth to Jerusalem and then north and south along the Jordan River. So they built, a, they built a, 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 a commerce house, and they hired tax collectors. And by the time of our text, one of them, the one named Zacchaeus, had so demonstrated an aptitude for this that he had been promoted up through the ranks. And now he was the chief tax collector of Jericho. A person used to having people under him, used to having people report to him, used to having people look to him to be told what to do. A person of means. You're told he's wealthy. A person who then had all the expectations that came with wealth, like being deferred to, like privileges and perks, and all the other things that come along with money. What's surprising, though, is that when Jesus came to Jericho and Zacchaeus wanted to see him, what's surprising is that Zacchaeus wasn't included on the city's welcoming committee. He didn't even expect to be. 
nor did Zacchaeus expect to get complimentary passes to the corporate luxury boxes from which he would have an unobstructed view of the proceedings, the same corporations his auditors were keeping an eye on. Zacchaeus didn't expect to be given anything. He didn't even expect people to get out of his way when Jesus came by. Surprisingly, this well-connected, wealthy, and influential, yet short-statured man, when he couldn't see Jesus, ran ahead and, think about this dignified rich guy, climbing a sycamore fig tree. It's as if he didn't expect anything from anybody. You know, as most people age and get on in life, maybe earning a little more money, gaining a little more status, they come to be treated, I think naturally so, with a little more respect. a little more nicely. If you've been so blessed in your life, haven't you kind of come to expect it now? The deference, the privilege, the respect. I mean, at work, you're not an intern anymore who has to have the copier explained to them. You're someone who brings something to the table. You're someone who contributes. You are a revenue stream at work. You should be treated as such. You've got the trophies and the awards on the wall to prove it. And in your family, you don't need to hear screaming babies anymore. Your kids have all grown and gone and are doing quite well, thank you very much. The only diapers you need to change anymore are the ones that happen to be on grandkids, and only if you want them. You certainly don't have to. You've already done that. You are at a point in your life where you deserve a little rest, a little respect. You deserve to get what you pay for and be paid what you're owed. So pity the poor, pimply-faced teenagers who forgets to put your fries in that bag at the drive-thru. And pity the thick-accented foreigner who, God forbid, has to explain to you why your cable bill went up. And pity that minimum wage oil change specialist at the dealership who inadvertently knocked some crud onto your air sensors and made your car run so rough you thought it was going to break and you wasted a day that you didn't have going back and forth to the dealership to see what was the matter with it. I mean, don't these people realize who I am? How can it be that you and I who've known Jesus for some time, can come off as grumpier and less grateful than the Zacchaeus who hadn't yet even laid eyes on him. Do I know how? It's those expectations. Because Zacchaeus collected taxes for the Romans. He didn't expect his Jewish countrymen to pay him the time of day, let alone respect or even common courtesy. He, they, he knew, they thought him a traitor and a crook. And the way they treated him, he felt he deserved. Our hearts will never laugh continually with gratitude as long as we think we're owed something. That we're being treated unfairly in a way we don't deserve because of who we are. That kind of heart is filled not with gratitude, but what? 
bitter. Remember a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the end of the world? We had a prayer at the end of that sermon, after the offering. And we prayed that God, that God would deliver us from the temptation to bitterness as the world falls apart around us. Bitterness is the opposite of gratitude. And it finds fertile heart to multiply like a germ, like a virus, in a heart that expects too much. Well, seemingly, and not by coincidence, not nearly as much of itself as it does of others. So if guilt and shame made Zacchaeus climb up that tree, what made him come down? Really? When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I think it's safe to say that at best, Zacchaeus expected to get a glimpse of Jesus that day. It said he wanted to know who Jesus was. Undoubtedly, he had heard about this miracle worker, this teacher, but in Luke chapter 15, we know Zacchaeus heard something even more because now everybody was muttering about Jesus because Jesus was welcoming sinners. And in Luke 15, it says some of them sinners were tax collectors just like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus probably even knew that one of Jesus' inner 12, one of those close followers, was also a tax collector, Matthew. Zacchaeus wanted to see who this guy was that would welcome someone like him. He just wanted to lay eyes on him. But when Zacchaeus finally did, all those expectations were blown out of the water because this Jesus knew who he was. This Jesus that he had heard all these things about, that he had gotten up that day hoping to get a glimpse of when he passed through town, turns out this Jesus had come to town looking for him. This Jesus knew where he was. He stopped right at the spot. Zacchaeus, come down. Called him by name. He knew where he was, who he was, what he was. And this Jesus even knew Zacchaeus' greatest need. I must stay at your house today. If guilt and shame made Zacchaeus go up that tree, then gratitude got him down. Gratitude also made him make amends many times over, many times over, to those he had cheated. And gratitude made him give half his possessions to the poor. I think it's safe to say that gratitude also made Zacchaeus one of those people who just always seems to be the fact that there's even a ha Thanksgiving holiday on our national calendar and that it's universally celebrated. And I've never heard of a separation of church and state lawsuit about Thanksgiving. Have you? Maybe I'm missing something, but weirdly enough, this holiday is fine. Even though it's probably the most religious of all. I think what that what accounts for that, in my opinion, is that everybody from time to time has experienced kindness that surprised them, that exceeded expectations, and thus they were grateful. Maybe they were at work and unexpectedly some coworker catches a mistake and saves the person of shame and embarrassment and even worse. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was a time of grief or illness in their home and a neighbor they barely knew brought over some food. I didn't expect this from you. I'm so grateful. 
So that there is a holiday where a whole nation of people stops and acknowledges that such things are good and appreciated ain't all bad. But as Christians, we're aiming for something more than being people who are occasionally surprised by the kindnesses of others. We strive to be among the people who seem to be faithful practically all the time. And there's a way we can do this. And it doesn't involve listing your blessings. And it doesn't involve comparing what you got to others who don't have as much. Rather, it involves daily contrition and repentance. Contrition means I'm sorry for these specific sins. Repentance means I throw myself at the mercy of God because I have sinned. When we daily do that, We can't help be surprised. We can't help be delighted when we hear that Jesus came to this world looking for us too. That he stopped where we are, called us by name, knows what we are, who we are, and what we need most of all, and he insisted on meeting that need sacrificing himself on the cross. Who would have expected that? From a God we continue to sin against, from a God that we often forget to even say thank you for, for the best things. This is the God that is kind to us beyond our imagination. Ran across a G.K. Chesterton quote. I've seen this guy's name all over the place. I'm an educated person. I should know who he is. So I looked him up today. He apparently is the guy that wrote the book that got C.S. Lewis to say, hmm, I shouldn't be an atheist. I should be a Christian. That's pretty impressive. He's also the guy that got Mahatma Gandhi to decide to do what he did. And a few other people like that. This is a, apparently one of the great writers and minds of the 20th century. He was a Christian apologist. That meant he defended the faith. That's why no one talks about him anymore today. Here's what he said about our topic tonight. Thanks are the highest form of thought. And gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I'm pretty sure Zacchaeus would agree with him. I'm even more sure that the kindness Jesus shows you and me every day in forgiving our sins and giving us a certain hope into an eternity that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for us until he comes back to get us, that that exceeds anything we expect, anything we deserve. The wonder of this alone, the wonder of this alone ought to be more than enough to make us those happy people who seem to be happy practically all the time. Wouldn't that be a great definition for a Christian in the eyes of the world? Those people who seem to be happy and grateful all the time, they're always saying thank you about sunny days, unexpected kindnesses, little things other people do. I wonder why. I want to see what this Jesus is about, too. Amen. May the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you could look in your bulletin to the top of the, I guess it would be the third or fourth panel on the inside. After the sermon, it says, the first article of the Apostles' Creed in Luther's explanation. Let's confess that together as it's printed out for us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all that exists, 
and that he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind, and all my abilities. And I believe that God still preserves me by richly and daily providing clothing and shoes, food and drink, property and home, spouse and children, land, cattle, and all I own, and all I need to keep my body and life. God also preserves me by defending me against all danger, guarding and protecting me from all evil. All this God does only because he is my good and merciful Father in heaven, and not because I have earned or deserved it. For all this I ought to thank and praise, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. We now have opportunity to give our thank offerings to the Lord. stand for prayer. We'll follow what's printed for us in the bulletin. Lord God, we thank you for many things, for the roofs that shelter us and the food that sustains us, for the people we enjoy these blessings with, especially during this Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you for all those who reflect the love of Christ in our lives. Thank you for this land and all it produces for our farms and factories, for a society where the rule of law is respected and the public good upheld. Thank you for our nation, our state, and this community. Bless those who hold offices of high trust so that we would continue to enjoy your blessings of peace, security, and well-being. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Hear us, Lord, as we give thanks for personal blessings. In your mercy, O Lord, hear the prayers of all who call on you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Let's remain standing to sing tonight's final hymn, which is number 610.
may be seated. Thank you for coming out to worship tonight. Um, announcements are uh, simply as you leave the sanctuary, if you're a member of our church and haven't picked up your 2016 offering envelopes, they're on the table just to your left. Please don't use 2016 offering envelopes during 2015. Some of you are. And while it's not the unforgivable sin, but it's bad for two reasons. It makes it hard on our volunteers who count the offerings. There's a blind system. They don't know who gives what. There's a number system. And they try to record it accurately. So you'd have a different number. You're using the wrong number. And then what are you going to do next November when there's missing envelopes? It wasn't Tom and my fault. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you're traveling tomorrow, be careful. Uh, drive carefully. If you're traveling tonight, extra on that. And uh, return for... Uh, this coming weekend, we have just uh, no church tomorrow night, of course, uh, but uh, we do on Sunday, 8.30 and 10.45. There's no Sunday school or Bible class, uh, just kind of a quiet Sunday morning. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, let me get to the back door, shake your hands. We thank uh, uh, the extra music the Schlicks gave us tonight. That was wonderful and we had special too. So uh, let's get to the back door, shake your hands. You have a great Thanksgiving holiday. God bless. <laughs>